Doc. Do it. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to City Field for the 30th anniversary celebration of the 1986 world champion, New York Mets. Now please direct your attention to the area behind home plate and welcome our MC for tonight's celebration, the voice of the New York Mets on WOR 710 Radio, Mr. Howie Rose. Thank you. It's fitting, isn't it? Last night... Thanks to Curtis Granderson, the Mets took a page right out of the 1986 playbook. Just as the players we pay tribute to tonight did 30 years ago, Terry Collins' Mets picked each other up. And so, as we celebrate the 1986 World Championship, this year's Mets are not only the defending National League champions, they are also in first place in the National League East. Let's face it, the link is indisputable. The good times have returned to Flushing. 
Thirty summers ago, Queens was the center of the baseball universe. It had been 17 years since the 1969 World Championship and 13 summers since New York had last won the National League pennant. The Mets and their fans were hungry for a return to the postseason and the result was one of the most dominant teams in Major League history. Tonight, we celebrate the resilient, beloved, and immensely talented 1986 world champion New York Mets. We begin by honoring the architect of the team. Hired as the Mets general manager in 1980, Frank Cashin began rebuilding the club and restocking its farm system. In 1986, the result was a franchise record 108 regular season wins and an October victory parade right up the Canyon of Heroes. Representing his late father, please welcome Frank's son, Greg Cashin. Every championship team kneels a field general. And no matter how good this team was, they needed the right manager, suited to the ball club. In this case, the 86 Mets, better than this former Oriole slugger. He took the reins in 1984 and immediately transformed the franchise into a contender, earning consecutive second place finishes leading to the magical season of 1986. Please welcome number five, Davey Johnson. Davey became the winningest manager in club history by assembling a talented team and coaching staff. His first base coach was a three-time world champion with the Pittsburgh Pirates, a man affectionately known by the players as Uncle Bill. We are joined tonight by the late Bill Robinson's wife, Mary, and son, Bill. Across the diamond, the club's third base coach had been the Mets shortstop for 13 seasons and a member of the storied world champions of 1969. The only Met to be in uniform for both the 1969 and 1986 World Series victories, please welcome Gold Glover, Mets Hall of Famer, one of the most beloved Mets of all time, Buddy Harrelson. Over the course of the 1986 season, the Mets suffered their share of injuries and physical challenges. Well, here's the man who patched up the players and kept them in peak condition for their championship run. Welcome back, head trainer Steve Garland. The 1986 Mets got off to an 11-game winning streak in April. That tied a club record, and that streak included a sweep of their arch rivals in St. Louis. The series began with a 10-inning thriller, thanks to a game-tying ninth-inning homer by the Met, simply known as Hojo. Number 20, Howard Johnson.
On May 17th, the Mets welcomed a new player to the clubhouse, a catcher who appeared in 49 games that season as a backup to Gary Carter. He went two for three in his debut and threw out his first base stealer. Welcome back, number 49, Ed Hearn. The 1986 Mets had six pitchers with double-digit win totals. This member of that elite staff finished the season with a 15-6 and six record and an impressive 2.81 earned run average. On May 27th, he tossed a complete game gem with 12 strikeouts to beat the Dodgers. One of the winningest pitchers in Mets history, number 12, Ron Darling. By June, the Mets were putting serious distance between themselves and the rest of the National League's Eastern Division. In a game against the Phillies on June 10th, Davey Johnson sent a right-handed pinch hitter to the plate in a tie game with the bases loaded. And the move paid off in grand fashion with a walk-off slam by number 11, Tim Tuffle. Pitching and defense are the cornerstones of any championship team, and the Mets had a bounty of both. In the field, there was no one better than the Mets' first baseman. On the 4th of July, he put on a defensive exhibition with three highlight reel plays against the Houston Astros. An 11-time Gold Glove Award winner who hit 310 that season, a five-time All-Star, and a Mets Hall of Famer, number 17, Keith Hernandez. Another staple on defense was a player who joined the Mets in 1984 and went on to set a National League Championship Series record at shortstop for putouts and assists. He also led the club with 12 intentional walks that season. Welcome back number three, Rafael Santana. On August 17th, the Mets tapped their farm system for a spot starter in a Shea Stadium doubleheader against St. Louis. This left-hander was summoned from AAA Tidewater, and boy did he deliver, allowing just one run in six innings for a 9-2 victory. Here is number 40, Randy Neiman. Let's face it, the divisional crown had been a foregone conclusion for much of the summer. But on September the 17th, it finally became a reality. With a magic number of one, the Mets' ace took the Shea Stadium mound for a game against the Cubs, clinching the team's first playoff berth in 13 years. Dr. K went 12-6 and six that season with 200 strikeouts. 1984 Rookie of the Year and 1985 Cy Young winner 
a Mets Hall of Famer, number 16, Dwight Gooden. The Mets' first postseason opponent was the Houston Astros. After dropping a one-to-nothing nail-biter in the National League Championship Series opener, the Mets really needed a win. And this lefty went the distance in Game 2 for a 5-1 to victory that tied the series. He led the Mets' starting rotation with 18 wins and a 2.57 ERA that season. Here is number 19, Bobby Ojeda. The Mets trailed Houston in the pivotal third game of the series when the second baseman, who led the 86 Mets with a 320 regular season batting average, sparked a remarkable comeback with a drag bunt single. He batted 333 in the World Series and tied for the team lead with four runs scored. Here is number six, Wally Beckman. He rose through the farm system to become the catalyst of the 1986 Mets, hitting 295 during the regular season and 300 in the postseason. Two batters after Backman's bunt, this tough as nailed center fielder hit a walk-off home run to give the Mets a 6-5 win in National League Championship Series Game 3, number 4, Lenny Dykstra. The series was even again for Game 5 when Dwight Gooden and Nolan Ryan locked horns in a power pitching duel. The game was tied in the 12th when the Mets RBI leader stepped to the plate with a winning run at second base. The man nicknamed Kid came through with a game winning single to move the Mets to within one game of the pennant. Here to represent charismatic 11 time All-Star and Baseball Hall of Famer Gary Carter, please welcome Gary's wife Sandy and son DJ. The pressure in Game 6 was palpable, with Astros Cy Young Award winner Mike Scott looming for the potential seventh and deciding game. The Mets fell behind early and called on one of their regular season starters to keep the Astros at bay. And that's just what he did, tossing three innings of one-hit ball to help the Mets clinch the National League pennant in a 16-inning thriller, number 38, Rick Aguilera.
The Mets faced the American League champion Boston Red Sox in the 1986 World Series. After dropping the first two games at Shea, the series shifted to Boston, where the Mets would need a designated hitter for the first time in club history. The DH that day came through with a two-run single in the first inning to give his team a lead it would never relinquish. Appropriately enough, his initials were also DH. Here again, number 25, Danny Heap. As you might remember, things looked rather bleak in Game 6, where the Red Sox took a two-run lead in the top of the 10th inning. The Mets were down to their final out. When Gary Carter singled, this talented young slugger followed with a pinch-hit single to keep the Mets' dreams alive. One of the most versatile athletes in club history, he played six of the nine defensive positions that season. Welcome back, number seven, Kevin Mitchell. New York was still an out away from elimination when this beloved veteran went to work at the plate, fouling off a succession of pitches to stay alive. The eighth pitch of that at-bat got away from the catcher, scoring Kevin Mitchell to tie the game and send Shea Stadium into a frenzy. And with a winning run in scoring position, he hit a slow bounce at a first that became one of the most famous plays in sports history. Number one in uniform, number one in your hearts. Here he is, Mookie Wilson. The Mets fell behind three to nothing in the second inning of game seven, forcing Davey Johnson to use his bullpen early. He brought in a young lefty with a blazing fastball and sweeping curve. The Hawaiian native retired seven of the eight batters he faced, four via strikeout. Please welcome a 1986 All-Star, number 50, El Cid, Cid Fernandez. The Mets were still facing that three to nothing deficit in the home half of the sixth when this native New Yorker ignited the Mets offense with a leadoff pinch hit single and a run scored. Before the inning was over, the game was tied at three. Here's the man who started that crucial rally, number 13, Lee Mazzilli. One inning later, this clutch third baseman slugged a leadoff homer to left, putting the Mets in front for the first time in that game. He batted 391 with a team leading nine hits in the fall classic. We are thrilled to finally welcome back the 1986 World Series most valuable player, number 22, Ray Knight.
leading by a single run in the bottom of the eighth. The Mets picked up some much needed insurance where their power hitting right fielder knocked one out of the park. The 1983 National League Rookie of the Year and franchise leader with 252 Mets home runs. He's a Mets Hall of Famer, number 18, Daryl Strawberry. With three outs standing between the New York Mets at a World Championship trophy, Davey Johnson called on his most trusted reliever to close the deal. The Mets closer retired the side of the ninth inning, striking out Marty Barrett for the final out of the 1986 World Series. Here is number 47, Jesse Orozco. Ladies and gentlemen, your 1986 World Champion, New York Mets.